Today on The Social. It's the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. We welcome Riley Yesno to the panel to discuss if terms like settler and colonizer should be more normalized in mainstream discourse. And I get my strength from my ancestors and my motivation from the future generation. Jess discovers how movement can be medicine with the founder of Sport for Spirit, Kendra Jesse. Then, bucket list worthy travel that offer authentic and immersive connections to the land and traditions of indigenous peoples in this country. Plus, the All Nations Juniors drummers are here to shine a spotlight on youth celebrating culture through sound. It all starts now on The Social. of you to a very, very special episode of The Social. Today is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which is a day for everyone across the country to reflect on the legacy of residential schools. At just six years of age, Phyllis Webstad got her orange shirt taken away from her. And today, we wear orange to honor all Indigenous survivors in solidarity with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. We also want to welcome back to the panel scholar and writer, Riley Yesno. Yeah. Always. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me again. We love this. Well, we're going to dive into our first topic, and it is a really interesting one. Yeah. In an opinion piece from TVO Today, one Indigenous person says that they often struggle with knowing how to refer to members of the dominant culture in their writing. Mm -hmm. So since to them, the options available kind of seem inadequate. They say that the most often used words these days are settler, colonizer, mm -hmm. Caucasian, but they also find various issues with all of those descriptors. So should the terms like settler like colonizer, be more normalized in mainstream discourse? Hmm. This is a big question, <laughs> right? That's a big one. Yeah, I mean, if you're asking me, I think the basic answer is yes, but it is more complicated yeah. than just that. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, indigenous already, we have to understand, is like an umbrella term, right? right. It mm -hmm. like homogenizes hundreds and hundreds of groups of people into mm -hmm. this one identity category. And so when I'm writing, if I'm talking about not that, mm -hmm. I'll say not indigenous. Um, writ large. And I say that because settler, while I don't think an inappropriate term by any means, mm -hmm. indicates somebody or a descendant of somebody who has a very specific relationship to colonization, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a settler, you are somebody who either came or benefits from the coming to this land mm -hmm. and had your ways of life imposed on the ways of life that were already here. Mm -hmm. But that's not everybody. Like right. black yeah. folks, brown folks, refugees, immigrants, like many of them don't come here and benefit from colonization and the dominant ways of life mm. in the way a specific group of people do. Mm. Um, and so just as I think we should be attentive to the million different differences within the indigenous umbrella, mm. I think that it's important that we are b doing the same with the non-indigenous side of things, right? So some, of pe some people are settlers and it's okay to say that. Some people are black and we should say that as well. We should be specific about what sort of relationship to colonization we're calling people to, I think. Mm. That's really mm. well said. That's really well said. I must admit, because it is such a heavy topic, this writer, I love that they brought a little bit of humor to the piece. I like tackling or being made to feel comfortable with a little bit of humor. And he suggested dispersed Europeans to call people <laughs> who look like me, which is what I do with you. Yeah. This is how I explain, you know, white people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is why you white people too. But I also like this one. Pigment denied. <laughs> pigment? Some pigment, but I'm denied a lot. You're wrong in comparison. I'm denied a lot. Yes, you Melanin are. Melanin deficient? Okay, you're, yes. You're ex ex 
explanation was so wonderful, but I need to unpack a little more why mm. um, those terms settler and colonizer mm. sort of irk me. And I think mm. it is because, or makes me feel uncomfortable. I want to be uncomfortable, but the only people who ever use it seem to be people who look like me. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of the way that Karen mm. has been co-opted from yeah. its original mm. meaning, <laughs> and now it's usually white men using it against white women, which is strange. I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I wonder if it's done in the tone, mm. if it is, because I feel like if you did it to me, I'd be fine with yeah, that. I'd be too. like, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and yet if someone else, if, depending on their intent, I, I, like, I think what people who look like me need to start to get comfortable with also is just mm. whiteness in general and being mm. told that. And I've seen so many times when that's called out in group chats, on social media, whatever, white people seem to have an a discomfort mm -hmm. that makes them angry when mm. they are called out. And mm. I think that anyone watching, if you felt uncomfortable about being called out by your whiteness, it's something for you to check in yourself. Totally, because yeah. people who have color are constantly being called out for that color. So I think that we first need to get comfortable with sitting with yeah. good white that's, yeah. and sit with that discomfort yeah that's, that's, that's that. such a solid point you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of a conversation i just had recently about the the difference between the word expat and immigrant oh right oh. an expat is a person living outside of their native land and an immigrant is a person living permanently in a foreign country but if you think about it it's the same thing <laughs> you're not from this place and now you're living in another place but let's be real when we talk expats we always think of them as british white mm -hmm. people who've gone somewhere to mm -hmm. take advantage of a situation or an opportunity opportunity or maybe for love, but when a person is brown or they're from a poor country, they're an immigrant, they're undocumented, yeah, they're illegal, right? right? Mm. So it reminds me of that same conversation that, you know, strikes, and again, it makes people very uncomfortable. And yeah. I think that's what we have to work on. Stop being so defensive. defensive. Mm -hmm. yes. And just listen and have the conversation. No one's trying to point the finger and say, this is what your ancestors did. It's like, <laughs> this is just the reality of the life and how you got here and how I got here and how my parents and grandparents and your parents got here. Let's just have a real conversation. Yeah, it is. Totally. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully. 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 Okay. Next up, our writer for the Globe and Mail is saying they are tired of explaining their indigenous culture to others mm. because they say that mm. after being asked the same type of questions, their enthusiasm for those con conversation wanes and can feel overwhelming. So, Riley, what's the difference between respectful curiosity mm -hmm. and tokenism? Yeah, okay, another great question, another heavy one, but I think it's actually like, it's way more about the context in which you're asking the question than the question itself for me. And so what I mean by that is like, when people ask me questions, I'm like, yeah, like I am a researcher in the subject area. Mm. I am a public speaker. In mm. some way, I consent to being asked questions mm -hmm. and having a response to give. But that's not just every indigenous person on the street, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Like, why are we assuming that each person is equipped to not only have those answers, but then also, like, I think that m very often people are asking for an answer to be given on behalf of the entire group. Mm. They're saying, so what do you think of land acknowledgments? And then I will make that my opinion on land acknowledgments. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is yeah. what now Indigenous people think, because mm -hmm. I've asked this one person, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a really inappropriate way to go about it. Are you just trying to extract knowledge? And for what? Like, in our cultures, um, if you're asking for, like, an insider sort of knowledge, there are protocols of, like, how how to give tobacco, when is the space, what can you ask for, what can't you? Mm. So it's not just like you're going in there trying to take their information. And I also think you should be really cognizant about the weight of the question that you're asking. Mm. Because like, for example, um, I remember when a couple years back, the, the 215 and everything that happened around Kamloops was in the news. And so many people were asking me questions about it. And I think for a lot of those people, there was just a genuine wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. But now I'm spending the rest of my day thinking about right. like these mm. unmarked graves and the atrocities of genocide and mm -hmm. it's like a lot heavier of a thing for me to be brought up than it is for like a person that doesn't have that direct tie mm -hmm. so it's more of a thing about maybe not the question itself but ask yourself is this an appropriate person is this an appropriate time yes. do i have things to offer back when i get this knowledge can i do my you know? own research as yeah. well yeah. Yeah. Like that onus that burden yeah. 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 It's, you know i know on the heels of the last on the heels of the last conversation 
it could be looked at as another form of colonization. I am here to take something from you. Mm. And I think that that's something really deep to sit with. I think that, have you ever been in a room where someone, you know, you think their intentions are good. They mm. want to learn something and they ask the most cringeworthy or they say the most cringeworthy things. <laughs> yep. It's like that odd uncle from a different generation. Yep. And you're like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed on your behalf. And I think if you are sitting on your phone for the million hours a day that every single one of us is sitting on your phone, stop expecting somebody else to educate you because yes. you have this thing. You have a question? <laughs> Don't ask Lila. Yes. You can ask this. Yes. And I think that, mm -hmm. I think it's questioning. I think it, intention matters. Mm -hmm. I think all of us want to be allies. And But the question is, didn't we all learn after the death of George Floyd, do not expect the oppressed group to also be your educator? Mm -hmm. That is not, mm -hmm. that is not the role. So mm -hmm. I think come with a good heart or just pick up your phone and learn for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I'll do you one better. The phone is the phone is a good place to start, but even that is a little problematic sure. because there's so much misinformation mm -hmm. on, on the internet. Try going by a library. They're everywhere. Yeah. 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 Pick up a book. <laughs> Ask about you, a book to read. There have been so many wonderful <laughs> authors who've written a lot of wonderful books where you can just educate yourself instead of turning to someone in a situation. This has happened to me so many times, and when you're the only person in the room, there's just this feeling, though, of just like, oh, here we go. Now I gotta give. Now I gotta yeah. educate. And I also mm. have to speak on behalf of my entire people. Right. Here yeah. I am. Right. Just Call me Martin Luther King. Like, I, I don't <laughs> always want to be in that headspace, but I say educate yourself. But I think there's this fine thing where I cannot describe it, where when I get asked that question, it's a feeling I know if it's if it's cruel mm. or if it really is curiosity. And I cannot describe it to you, but I know when it's cruel. Yes. And I just wish that people could understand that. I wish I could articulate it, but it's like, it's the most uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Lots of, to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're just getting started, if yes. you can believe that. We're just getting started. <laughs> On the other side of the break, why a woman is in trouble with her parents after she suggested, yeah, you can move in to my garage. <laughs> We're gonna tell you more about this tricky topic of housing for our elder parents when we come back. We'll be back. <laughs> special edition of The Social. We'd love for you to connect with us online and join in on the very important conversations we're having all hour long. All right, so would you offer your parents space to live with you in their later years? Well, you guys are quiet oh, yeah. on that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 All right, well, a user posted to Reddit oh. saying their mother and father are offended after she offered them a chance to live rent-free in her garage slash guest house. It's a garage that's now a guest house, right? Yeah. Not a garage, yeah. just so we're clear. Now, according to her parents, they assume that they would be living in their daughter's main house since it has five bedrooms and she's currently living there by herself. <laughs> so, who is in the wrong? This is a tricky one, Jess? I say everyone's in the wrong in this particular scenario. <laughs> okay, um, oh, so. Because the, pe the, the, the daughter left it for like truly moving in day mm. to sort of um, articulate, no, 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 you're not in the main house, you're in the garage. So okay. that is something I think, like that's a huge life moment your parents moving in with you, whether it's on the property, somewhere on the property. And I think the daughter messed up, but I think these parents also messed up. You're telling me that you wouldn't choose the guest house that's fully <laughs> outfitted, yep. beautiful kitchen, washroom, separate living space, wi -Fi. than living in the main <laughs> house with your grown you daughter? It's true. Yeah, like I'm all for it's generational a... living, but I think it's when it's done in one house. That's out of necessity, because you don't got the guest house. Yeah. <laughs> but if you got the guest house, yeah. I live in the, the guest, guest house. house. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I'm just curious, too. Like, I feel like I need more context, because I'm like, why are they just, like, are they downsizing? In which case, like, the guest house, I don't see why there's a problem with that. Are they looking for caregiving? Like, in that way, it makes more sense to me that they might be in the main house. But, like, it just, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of context and no communication with anybody. Mm. Like, the key. why build not? 
non communication. Yeah. They show up with your bags at your door yeah. and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, actually. <laughs> yeah. My dogs have a room here. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was rich. That it's was rich. It, I mean, communication, you're hitting the nail on the head. It's, it's like these conversations, and I'm at this stage of life, I think a lot of us are, where mm. people are dealing with this with their parents or it's on the horizon. And I just keep on thinking, we have to have these conversations. We have to start them early mm. and often. It's like the sex ed conversation, except for less fun. But you need to keep <laughs> on going yeah. through it and figuring out what are people's wants, what are people's desires, what are the expectations, will you need in-house care, can you facilitate that? My, like my grandparents were the ones who were like, do not even stress about it, we want to go in a home. That's not everyone's wow. situation. A lot yeah. of people, wow. but you have to, otherwise it's just gonna be it upon guess. you and you gotta figure it out on the fly. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think there's three C's in this for me. It is culture, it is communication, and it is caregiving. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the culture component is, if you come from where I come from, if you're Filipino culture, Portuguese culture, it is assumed your parent will never go in a home. They will be with you. So mm -hmm. there is a cultural component to this and we accept that. Uh, the communication part is exactly to your point. I don't know why the conversation was left so last minute. Something so vital. It's a hard conversation to have it's like planning a funeral but you're going to be so much happier when that day arrives that you talked about it years mm -hmm. in advance not mm -hmm. when you have to right. but when you have the time to and lastly is caregiving mm -hmm. when they get to an age and, and anybody who's got an aging parent knows guess who's going to do the caregiving mm -hmm. probably not your husband it's probably you as the woman so mm -hmm. i think that the caregiving part of this is us as the sandwich generation i have a young child and i have aging parents who's going to have the discussion is the expectation i'm taking on more so there are conversations that have to happen mm -hmm. so that everybody is happy. Ask your parents, mm -hmm. what does your senior years look like to you? Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. have that conversation yeah. and let's how, how to make it happen. Yeah, and there's also a lot of, in that culture conversation, there's a lot of assumptions that if you're not married and don't have children, that naturally the parents are obviously going to yeah. your house. Yeah. Yeah. And like that's amongst where, siblings, you mean? Like, well, yeah, amongst, yeah. If you're the only one who doesn't, right. if you're not married, you're not sharing your house, well, of course, that's why I think culturally there's probably yeah. an expectation of like, of course I'm in your house. But those parents, I don't think that those parents are like, I don't think they're being real with themselves. You've lived with each other before. You know you don't communicate well. <laughs> and you also, if you're honest with yourself, it's probably been a long time since you guys have been under the same roof. Mm. She's doing you a favor by having that guest exactly. house. Yeah. And in the long Take run, the it makes house. everybody happy because it's a perfect situation. If you can get this where you are close enough to be like right across the street or right in the backyard yeah. to go see your parents if anything happens. That's the dream. Without being on top of each other. Because I'll tell you, as we get older, I'm speaking on behalf of all, everybody who's single who lives by themselves, you don't want to live with us. We are a nightmare. <laughs> we want things done and put in a certain way. And then when you don't do it, we give you the look and we're like, no, it's fine. But you know it's not fine. <laughs> you don't want us to live in that situation. Be grateful that there is a guest house for you to live yes. in. Trust me okay. on that one. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Do live with you who's doing the grocery shopping. So a TikToker is going viral after posting their hot take that there should be a senior age limit on who is able to use the self-checkout oh at the supermarket. So hot hot take. They say it's a lane that's intended to be quick and speedy. So if you don't have your quick and speediness, get out of the lane. So do we agree mm -hmm. that self-checkouts mm -hmm. should have an age limit? Oh my god, can somebody Please call the ages in police. Thank you. <laughs> I am against this idea. I have also seen very young people who are terrible at the self-checkout, okay? So don't give me this age thing. And I don't know why we make, again, we always do this. Corporations pit people against people. Mm -hmm. Why did they take away all the people, the human cash cashiers? Yep. Mm -hmm. money, you know what? Money. Exactly. So maybe that older person, maybe they don't want to go fast because they're retired. They have nowhere to go. They can take their time and maybe they want to mm -hmm. talk to a real person. So why are you only off? Offering us self checkouts. I mean, maybe we want to check out with a real person. So stop mm. putting us against each other. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what makes me so angry thinking about this smug TikToker being like, oh my God, it took me three minutes instead of one minute at this. Where do you have to be? Where do you have to be? And also, he's complaining about that amount of time. You're busy at the self-checkout, but when you're walking down the street oh, in a public area, walking it. upstairs, you're taking up the whole sidewalk, you're going 0 0.05 miles per staring hour, at your staring phone. at your phone, holding me up. Mm. Yeah. Like, get out of my way. Yeah. Get out of my way. Yeah. Put my phone down and walk. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, and seriously, ageism 
and ableism are like two circles that are essentially overlapping because like what they're actually saying, it's not about the age, it's that they think this person's too slow to be in the same spaces as them. Yeah. But there are a lot of people, not just old people, who are too slow for like mm -hmm. what you would consider, what this person considers like an expectation. And it's a classic able-bodied, ableist mm -hmm. mentality to not say, let's make things more accessible. Let's make these things more intuitive. Let's find ways to make people be able to move through this space with greater ease. And instead, if you can't keep up, Screw you, yeah. right? Like, yeah. right. That's BS. You know? Have yeah. you ever? But, okay, yes. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, Cynthia's gonna step in it. Wait, wait, wait. I hear everything you're saying, but I will admit, I will call myself out. I have been in a checkout where I don't have a lot of time. I've chosen the self checkout. I know, and there's somebody who a didn't bring their glasses, and I'm guilty of this. Doesn't know where the vegetable is. Did I get the organic? Did I get whatever? And they're sitting there, and they're, they can't see that the green light is. If there's a thing open for you, like. Can we at least just push those people or do something <laughs> to just get them going? Oh my gosh. Look, no, no, I'm like, I got nothing. Listen, <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm with you. Old doesn't mean that you're less smart. Yes. I've, I, I'm go. around a lot of young people and I don't want to insult them, but just last week I was crossing the street and there was an advanced light and the girl beside me who was a teenager did not know how to cross the street. And I was like, here we go. <laughs> So I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, when we get back, everybody, Jess will be getting a lesson in mindful movement from the founder of Sport for Spirit, Kendra Jesse. You can't miss this. We'll be back right after this. is important for our physical journey, but how does it impact our spiritual and mindful selves? I spent some time with athlete Kendra Jesse to find out how movement can also be medicine. Take a look. So Kendra, you are an athlete, you're a coach, you're a fancy shawl dancer, and you are the founder of Sport for Spirit. I think most of us know that movement facilitates better health, but you take it a step further and say that movement facilitates healing. How so? When you experience a loss or you experience something that hurts you and you have that pain, um, like the only way to like, you can't, go around it, you can't go under it, you have to go through it. And breaking those cycles of like intergenerational healing and love and joy and respect instead of that intergenerational trauma or like the hurt and pain that's been happening to indigenous people, it's really helped me to just heal, to start to like, you know, be able to pass on better things to the yeah. generations that are coming after me. So I have this saying I like to say, it's I get my strength from my ancestors and my motivation from the future generation. I love that. <laughs> that's incredible. And that's perfect because you have a series of movements that sort of take us through generations. Each movement that we do is going to be dedicated to a different generation. You're being mindful with it and you're thinking about, okay, so I'm going to do this exercise and you think about who is for, if it's for your parents or for yourself. And so it just helps to be more like meaningful and to make things more mindful. We're gonna move into split squats. Okay. You want your most of your weight to be in your front um, foot. So we're just gonna step back. This is where you go down straight, yeah. right? And I'm thinking about my grandmother. Yes. Yeah. Switch sides. If you're doing, say, one side, you can think of one grandparent and then think of the other one okay, on the I'm other do side. That. <laughs> okay, Gus. let's go. Oh, do you hear that crap? Yes. <laughs> And I chose all movements that make me feel really strong and powerful and balanced as a person. So last one here. Good job. Love that. <laughs> so the next generation is parents and we're gonna do some plank shoulder taps. So this is a fun one. It's a little bit hard, but it requires a lot of stability in your core and balance. Which our parents gave yes, us. Yes, right? <gasps> parents. Butts down. Yeah. And think about our parents. Is one side always harder for you than the other side? Okay. Yes, always. Okay, here we go. So we'll go for one, two, three, four. Job. Oh. <laughs> do you know, I do those occasionally sometimes, but it was actually 
might sound nuts, but it was easier to do while thinking about my parents. Right. I felt yeah, more locked in. Yes. After parents, what comes next? Now we do a round for ourselves. We can't <gasps> forget about ourselves. So again, think about yourself, you know, this, your life, your spirit, your mind, your body, your heart. I lost count, so we'll do two more. <laughs> uh, tricks! Yes. I love being able to think like you yeah, said. I was definitely. thinking about that. Yeah. And just in that moment, it's like everything else gets shut out. We did ourselves, so next would have to be children. Yeah, so now we're moving into the future. If you don't have any of your own children, like I don't have any of my own children yet, so it's like if you have, um, you know, your aunt, your nieces or your nephews or cousins, it's gonna be side lunges. Okay. This is a fun one, it makes me feel really solid. Fun, let's see, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna widen our feet, our stance to be a bit wider than our shoulders down for the yeah. kids <laughs> this is reminding me of my youth it's a little easier to do this can you feel that in your inner thighs a bit when you do that oh okay, yeah so it's not just for me. sure <laughs> children i can't believe how much better i feel right that's why we say movement is medicine you always feel better after you move your body well i feel better after having met you kendra thank oh, you so much thank you. oh my god yeah. experience and I have to admit it was a way of mindfulness I'd never fully considered before and I feel lucky that we got a chance in the makeup room mm. you were saying that generational the seven ancestors that yeah, generational yeah. thing it's something that you know about yeah so I've always heard of it as called the seven generations teaching which okay. is Anishinaabe as I understand and like there's a different like versions of the teaching but it's a pretty common one or a popular one and the basically the idea is is that if you're in the middle and you might know your parents your grandparents and maybe you knew your great-grandparents, and that's mm -hmm. three generations there. And if you have kids, or again, like she was saying, nieces, nephews, you would have your kids, uh, your grandkids, and if you're really lucky, maybe you'd know your great-grandkids, yeah. right? And it's a way of situating yourself amongst seven different generations and really thinking about the impact of like what it means to be a dutiful ancestor, I mean, a dutiful descendant to these people and yeah. a good ancestor going forward. Oh, wow. And you're supposed mm -hmm. to think, does this honor the th at least mm -hmm. three generations back, and does this serve the three generations at least to come forward. It is so effective. It's a really beautiful. And it's really calming. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Uh, that was so wonderful, Jess and Riley. We always appreciate you being here and sharing so much of your storytelling with us. So thanks for coming. Thank you. And on the other side of the break, Keith Henry from Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada will be showing us some travel destinations to add to our bucket list. I cannot wait for this segment. We'll be back right after this. So good. Welcome back, everybody. We all know that Canada has incredible places to explore, but did you know that before the pandemic, Indigenous tourism was the fastest growing travel sector in Canada? I did not know no, that. Did you guys know that? I did not know that. But here to tell us about the current state of Indigenous tourism in this country and share some exciting experiences that you'll want to put on your bucket list is the president and CEO of the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, Keith Henry. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> well, these stats are astounding. So according to your organization, one in three international visitors to Canada and more than half of domestic travelers within our country are looking for an Indigenous destination. So what sets apart Indigenous travel experiences mm -hmm. from, say, let's say, other experiences? Yeah, I think Canada is an amazing country. Uh, but what we haven't really done a really great job is understanding the history and stories of, of what we have ancient culture here, and we think of ancient often as Egypt or other, mm -hmm. you know, romantic international destinations, but we have it right here in our backyards. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are coming to realize that Canada is this amazing destination, and they're looking at us in a different way, both domestically and internationally. I think that's really becoming much more attractive for the world. 
Mm. I, I mean, that. we heard the shock off the top when yeah. we mentioned about how this, before the pandemic, the Indigenous tourism yeah. was the fastest growing travel sector in Canada. So let's talk about the impact that the pandemic had yeah. mm. on this sector. Yeah, it was uh, quite, de- I've been I've been doing this for 19 years now, uh, helping market and promote Indigenous tourism. And 2019 was our best year ever, About just about $2 billion in revenues for wow. Indigenous wow. tourism. Good. Big business, 1,900 uh, businesses, about 40,000 mostly Indigenous people working in the sector. And overnight, it just, it, it really, we were the hardest of the hard hit. Mm. And so it was quite devastating from 2020 to about 2022 or so. But the fortunate news is today we're, it's coming back. And, and, and because of things that have happened over the last few years, I actually see higher demand than I saw in 2019. Huh. So we know the realm of the possibility is still uh, a lot more in front of us. Mm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, the industry leaders say that Canada has the potential to be a global leader in Indigenous tourism, but despite the recent federal in, uh, investments, um, there's still a lack of support, which mm-hmm. is huge. So what needs to be done yeah. so that they can get the support that they need? Well, like any business, right? And we, we I know that there's a lot of emotion and, and sort of social support for Indigenous issues. I know that in Canada. I, I'm an Indigenous person myself. We live it. But I really think that we have, it's like anything. If we want to business to grow, we have to invest in marketing and development, and it's got to be predictable, sustainable. And often Indigenous programming, it starts, it stops, it goes away. It starts, it stops, it mm-hmm. goes away. In our world on Indigenous economic development, I've been I've seen that for many, many years. And so we're trying to um, put strategies out and, and, and have the entire industry and governments at all levels, federal, provincial, municipal, they all need to understand that these investments will actually help them as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think we have to get people to understand that narrative. Mm-hmm. So, so why is it important, important for funding to level the playing field between mm-hmm. Indigenous and non-Indigenous sort of travel businesses? Well, like anything, you know, right here, we're in Toronto today, you know, there's marketing dollars to promote Toronto. Yeah. Well, we don't have the same level of tools to market Indigenous tourism. We depend on others that might want to help us out to market us. And what we're saying, it needs to be Indigenous-led. We know the tools. We know the brands. We know how to market authentic experiences. That's mm-hmm. the whole point of what differentiates us. And I mm-hmm. think that having the industry and, and partners understand that's really important. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to learn about some of these amazing Indigenous destinations, don't yeah. you? Mm-hmm. I cannot wait. The first one you're going to take us to is in British Columbia. So tell us about it. Yeah, it's a beautiful wilderness resort, Clahoos Wilderness Resort. It opened up in 2021. It's Ooh. a luxury style resort. It's wow. absolutely breathtaking. Yeah. It's a five star experience. And what they've done is repurpose an existing sort of business that the community bought. They're now hiring Clahoos guides. They now these are things that are helping promote Clahoos artists. And these are the things that it's yes, it's whale watching, and yes, it's outdoor adventure and, and sightseeing. But you add the indigenous storytelling about the lands and the water there, and it really adds a special element to that experience. Beautiful. Love it. Wow. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to head to Alberta next. So what should we do there? Well, one I really appreciate is Mohican Trails. It's in Canmore. Um, and what it is, it's a, it's a guided walking tour. And I'm trying to show you the breadth and depth of I showed you a wilderness resort. Now this is an outdoor adventure walking tour. You learn about the medicinal plants, how the indigenous people lived on the land. These are guided tours to help educate and provide that that awareness. And a lot of people wonder, how did Indigenous people survive? They teach it if you want it. And these are the way, when we talk about reconciliation, these are the things, if you truly want, there are experiences that will actually guide you to those learnings. Oh, wow. So what was yeah. the name of that place? That we were just... Mohican Trails. Okay, Mohican Trails. And you can do that all year round. All then. year round. Okay, that's so fascinating. Because yeah. I imagine you would learn different things. About, Absolutely. Depending, depending on the season. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. incredible. Oh, sorry, we have time to talk about one more travel option. And it is right here in Ontario. Tell us about it. Yeah, Wikwamakon Tourism. Uh, it's about six hours north or so here in Toronto. Uh, Toronto, sorry, not in Toronto, out of Toronto. And uh, But it's uh, they've been doing tourism for a while in the community, but they've added some more Indigenous culinary experiences. You know, that when any of us travel, we love to get out and eat. Uh, they do. Uh, they have uh, Anishinaabe guides, the Bambabake uh, uh, Memorial Trail. They take you out, you forge for food, and you actually... So you learn how to cook it traditionally, whether it's stone cooked uh, uh, venison, or they might do uh, you know trout traditionally with a cedar plank, or or they they wrap it. So I mean, these are all kind of indigenous culinary experiences that is truly world class. Yeah, That's absolutely. Wow. Every oh single God. place you've mentioned is now on my bucket list of places that I need yeah. to go and yeah. see. Um, and for anybody who's looking for more information and wants an authentic tour, where should they start? You know, the the, the platform I would encourage everyone is our main consumer platform, DestinationIndigenous.ca. Mm-hmm. You'll see 
see hundreds of businesses like this in every province and territory, the north, the east, the west, the south. Mm -hmm. And these are authentic Indigenous-owned experiences that are really promoting Canada in an amazing way. Beautiful. I love that. Oh, I just, that, just it is amazing. I want to say I've actually used your website and I've traveled based on your website. So it is the real deal. So thank you well, for yeah. everything you're doing thank as well. You. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. All right, so when we get back, the All Nations Juniors Drum Circle will be here with a very special performance. Please do not go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back. If you've attended a powwow in the Toronto area, you might have been fortunate enough to see the All Nations Junior Drummers. They're a group that was formed by our next guest nearly 10 years ago. So Kevin Myron, Dakota from Birdtail, Manitoba, is a knowledge keeper, sun dancer, and community uncle at Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre. And we are thrilled to have him and the All Nations Juniors here today. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Morning, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, when you started the All Nations Juniors, what were you actually even thinking to do at the time? Well, at the time, I was just looking for a way to show our youth um, some pride. Pride in who they are, right? Because, uh, as you guys know, residential schools, they took the pride away from our elders. Right? So I wanted to bring that back for the youth. And I, I found a drum at Toronto Council Fire, and we started a cultural day. I put that drum out there, right? and all the boys walked around, looked at it, and they decided they liked it. And they <laughs> I love that. All right, so you host open drumming sessions for youth every Tuesday at the Toronto Council Fire Center. I said that correctly, right? Yep. Want to make sure I get it right. Um, tell me, what did you want to focus on bringing drumming to the youth? Like I said, I wanted to bring that pride, mm -hmm. right? And drumming is like, like a fun way to do things, right? And whenever that drum's around, it, it like calls you towards it. That, that drum beat itself is the heartbeat of our mother, mm -hmm. our mother the earth, mm -hmm. right? So all nations... Like, all nations feel that drum beat when we sing. And you guys will feel that today when we sing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we call our drum group, All Nations. Mm -hmm. We love that. Yeah, and I'm curious, what do you hope to see for the future of the All Nations Juniors? Well, they're doing it now. And I'm getting mm -hmm. to see it now because a lot of our members have been here for quite a long time since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And they're working with other youth, mm -hmm. right? And they're bringing that culture to other youth. Um, they're showing the other youth how to be proud to be First Nations, mm -hmm. you know, how to be them. We're going to get into a performance portion in just a second. Can you give us a little bit more of the history? You said the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about the history of the drum. That drum itself was a, a, a peace agreement between two nations, right? uh, the Ojibwe Nation and the Dakota Nation, uh, so we didn't war with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's still doing its work. So whenever you go around that drum, you'll see all different nations sitting around that drum, and all we do is we celebrate. Mm -hmm. We celebrate in a good way. We sing hard. And we dance hard and we celebrate for our ancestors. We celebrate for those residential school survivors. And we celebrate for those future generations. Mm -hmm. so I'm, yeah, sorry. Beautiful. I'm just curious. When you host those drumming sessions, do you see a change in those young people before they start and after they... Oh, I do. Yeah, what do you see? Oh, I, I see the pride come out. Mm. You know, when they do their first lead, when they first get the confidence to do a lead, or they actually get the confidence just even just to sing, mm. that, that, that look of pride on them, right? That, that ability to be First Nations. When I grew up, you know, it wasn't uh, always cool to be First Nations, and these days it is. No, mm -hmm. oh, I love that. So um, you have the um, All Nations here to perform today. Can you tell us about the song you'll be playing? Oh, the song that we, like, we had a big, big song list of uh, many songs, right? And the song we chose is one of our original songs, and we thought it would be an upbeat song for our residential school survivors walking, mm -hmm. uh, watching today. So we hope that they, they hear the song and their hearts are, are, are uplifted. Mm -hmm. And it's one of their own, made by Dakota Myron. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. sorry. And as we're watching the performance, you say there's something in particular that you'd like us to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that? There's actually two things I'd like to pay attention to. One's the heartbeat, right? That, that drum beat, mm -hmm. right? And another is look on those boys' faces, right? Mm -hmm. That pride, that joy they have in singing, right? You know, and, 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 that, and that's what we want for our youth, to be able to feel proud, not like not like a residential school survivors, you know, where they were made to feel uh, ashamed of, you, of who they were. Mm -hmm. right? If somebody is watching and they say, you know, this is something I want to learn for my culture, mm -hmm. how do they reach out to you? Oh, they're welcome to call Toronto Council Fire. They can hold a, get a hold of Jaden uh, Wemegwans, mm -hmm. and he's our uh, drum lead for, for that, that practice. And everybody's welcome. Any age? 
any age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love that. Well, Kevin, uh, we want to thank you so much for being here, uh, taking the time uh, for you and all seven members of uh, the All Nations Juniors. They are now going to perform for us here in studio. Let's do it. Let's take a look. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, we want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of our guests today, Riley, Kendra, Keith, Kevin, and all of the All Nations Juniors drummers. We appreciate all of you taking the time to share your stories with us here today. And thank you to every single one of you here. Thank you to this beautiful audience. And thank you to each and every one of you watching at home as well for joining in on these important conversations today. You can always catch up on the show. Find us on Crave or YouTube. You can also listen to our podcast on the iHeartRadio app. And we want to say we'll see you same time, same place next time. Take care. <laughs>